Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I'll go ahead and read, and then we'll get into our Bible study here. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man, a certain man of Bethlehem, uh, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the, the, man, the, name of the uh, rather, the, the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilian, sons of uh, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they, did I do this right? I'm in the right place. Okay, boy, I'm, I'm telling you, my brain's slow too. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab, the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malan and Kilian also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. When faced with a decision in life, big or small, we try to make the best choice. But sometimes, despite our good intentions, we do make bad choices. That's something that's going to happen because we're human. We do make mistakes. When you get into the book of Ruth, the book of Ruth is an amazing book. It's a very powerful book. You can actually almost feel the emotion just in the first five, five verses of the tragedy that this family went through. And, and what we see here is that the first five verses of Ruth begins with the story of a family who was faced with a big decision in life. What, what was happening is that they were actually experiencing a shortage of food. And that's not a good thing. It's a family of four. You need food. You got to eat. You have children. But we see here that they had to make a decision. What are they going to do? Are they going to stay? Where are they going to go? I mean, you got to decide on what to do when it comes to a situation like that, when it comes to their own land. Well, the father decided to go. Now, we're going to see in a moment whether it was a good choice or a bad choice. But we see right away the setting is not all, all that exciting. Notice what it says there in verse 1, that it was in the days when the judges ruled. This was not a very good time. If you've ever read the book of Judges, the book of Judges is the darkest period in the life of, of Israel. It, it was such a bad, bad, dark time that the children of Israel were involved in so many bad, bad things. The days of Judges were dark days in Jewish history. It was a day of national apostasy. It was kind of like a falling away from the faith. And when you read in Judges chapter 21, if you just go to your left there, at verse 25, the book ends with a frightening statement. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Would you like to live in a country like that? I don't think so. This describes the days of Judges. This is what was going on. You see, what happened is that God delivered Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And when he did that, it wasn't to just let them go. It's like, I'm going to deliver you guys and just run across the desert. You're on your own. What God wanted to do, he wanted to establish a theocracy. So, so what God wanted to do is establish one nation under God. So he wanted to rule them himself. So when he tried to do that, they rebelled against his leadership. So they start asking for a king. So God said, fine, you want a king? Then go for it. So they went from a theocracy to a monarchy, a nation ruled by kings. First king was Saul, a maniac, a weirdo. But they had their king. And, and after that, there were some good kings, bad kings, good kings, bad kings. But it went from a theocracy to a monarchy. And then finally, they plunged into this anarchy. And that was a nation ruled by no one but themselves. Now, that's a bad, bad way of kind of heading uh, as a nation to start from God ruling you to God allowing judges or allowing kings to rule you, and then all of a sudden, you don't want God's rule, you don't want man to rule you, then you're on your own, now you're in a state of anarchy. 
And that's exactly what happened to Israel. Israel just decided to just kind of go on their own. And the Lord allowed that. And what we see here is that Israel became a disobedient and adulterous people, or idolatrous people. They were disobedient in the sense that they rejected God's law. They were disobedient in all the commands that God wanted to give them. They did not want to live by God's commands at all. They're, they're basically backsliders. And somebody who is an idolatrous person will turn to idols to basically satisfy their sinful desires. And that's exactly what they did. They went after other gods. Listen to what Judges chapter 3, verse 7 says. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the vows and the asterisks. Now what was worse is that their kids suffered from their spiritual apostasy. Listen to this, Judges chapter 2, verse 10. After that whole nation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Listen, can I talk to you parents? Do not stop talking to your kids about Jesus. Let them grow up with Christ. Don't be afraid. Don't think it's too hard. You don't need to be a Bible scholar to raise your kids in the ways of the Lord. Teach them the word. Talk to them about Jesus. Connect the dots for them. My little four-year-old is constantly asking questions about this and that, and I'm trying to connect the world that God created so she understands the biblical worldview because I know when she gets old enough, she's going to be presented a secular worldview. But I want her to understand that there is a biblical worldview. I want her to think biblically. And if I stop that, the culture will take her. So... Parents, you have a huge job. If you have little ones, teenagers, even bigger than that, right? To just instill in them truth, God's truth. And don't be afraid if they roll their eyes. They'll hear it. I've run into so many prodigals, so many PKs, pastors, kids, that have actually gone away from the Lord that can still quote Scripture more than me because it's in their heart. It'll never leave, as the Bible says, right? The word will never come back void. So keep giving it to them. Don't worry about what they do. But just trust the Lord. Pray for them. Well, the children of Israel blew it because the next generation that came up, they basically were kids and young adults that didn't care and didn't know the things of the Lord. That's why it's important for us as parents to just keep giving them Jesus and not stop, especially these days right now they are getting very, very dark. You know, one of the marks of a backslider is one who doesn't want to live under God's rule. They prefer to live under their own authority without any accountability. And that's exactly what the children of Israel did. They did not want any accountability at all. In fact, there's a really crazy story in Judges 19. The story about a Levite who had a concubine and a servant, and they basically were heading out, uh, uh, traveling, and they came to this place, this, this town square, because they were resting. Nobody wanted to take them in until one old man came to them and said, hey, where are you guys going and what are you doing? And, of course, as the Levite explained where, where he was heading and what they were doing, he says, you need to leave this place. This place is bad. The town square here, this is this, you're gonna get you're gonna get mugged. You know, I mean, more worse than that. You'll, you'll see where I'm going with the story, what actually happened. You know, at that time, being in that area was was bad. You know, it's it's like taking a walk at nighttime through Central Park. I don't think anybody would want to do that. If you Google the worst parks in the world, uh, Central Park is up there in New York City. It's beautiful in the daytime. I've been there plenty of times taking pictures, all the beautiful flowers, springtime. But at nighttime, uh-uh, you better get out of there. Listen to this. I read this recently. In the last four years, Central Park has had 649 serious crimes, including 13 rapes and, 14, or, and 415 grand larcenies. 
So don't go for a walk out there, okay? If you go, ever go out there at night, it's not romantic, okay? You'll be in trouble. And that's exactly what these guys were doing. They were resting in a place at night that was very, very violent. So the man takes him in. So as he goes in his house, other guys, the Bible describes them as perverted guys, saw that he actually took in these guys with him, the Levite. And they came in knocking on the door and said, hey, we want you to give us that man because we want to sleep with him. And the guy says, no, please don't do that. I'll give you my virgin daughter and his concubine. Take them, do whatever you want with them. So they refused, and they took the concubine, raped her, left her half dead. As the Levite went off the next day, found the poor woman at the doorstep. He picked her up, takes her home. She dies. He cuts her up in 12 pieces. Yep, that's in the Bible. And then he basically ships all those pieces to the, to the 12 territories of Israel. Could you imagine getting something like that in the mail? Oh, honey, look, did you get something at Amazon? What is it? Oh, uh, what? An arm? This is not in order that. Imagine that. That's sick. Why did they do that? There's no accountability. These guys were all over the place with immorality. They didn't care. They, were, they didn't know what was going on. The days of the judges was just horrible. It was very dark. And you know what? Today we are living in some desperate times where people today want to rule themselves. They, they don't want God's leadership. They don't want even man to, you know, I guess, uh, you know, people that should actually govern them. They don't even want that. They're rebelling against everything. And not just adults, but kids don't want anybody to say anything to them, any kind of, any kind of direction. They want to basically make what they think is right in their own eyes legal and accepted today. It's my truth. You know, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. It's called moral relativism is what it's called. It's like, you have your truth, Christians. I got my truth. And, and we see here that in the world today, this is something that's actually happening. You know, my wife was listening to a song. She just kind of just, she, I think she was um, at a store or something, and, you know, they play music. And she was telling me, she was, you know, I heard a song that was pretty crazy. And it sounds like a young girl singing this song, and the lyrics were crazy. I said, well, what's, what was it called? You know, and I'm, I'm Googling. You know, I love Google. I'm sorry, you know. I, I always say, if Google doesn't have it, it doesn't exist. You know what I mean? So, so it's like, I just type in two words, man. I get it right there, you know. I said, so what did the song say? What did, uh, and I'm doing, and I caught it. And I found the song. And I'm like, really? Well, the song was this, and it was interesting. This is a 16-year-old girl. Some of you may know who she is. Her name is Bia Miller, 16-year-old singer. She came in ninth place on, on season two of The X Factor. She signed to Hollywood Records, and her 2014 uh, debut EP song is called uh, Young Blood. And it's a song about young people basically calling the shots. And listen to this, and I got the lyrics. Now, I'm not going to sing it, but part of the lyric goes like this. Listen to this. We are... We were making history, breaking rules, and breaking free, questioning the writing on the wall. And then the chorus goes like this. We've got young blood. Can't destroy us. We make our own luck in this world. We've got young blood. No one chose us. We make our own love in this world. A 16-year-old singing this. This is, where, this is where our culture is. This is where our young people are going. It's sad. And this song, actually, her EP peaked at number two in, on iTunes. And even more crazy is that it had a great debut on the Billboard 200, peaking at number 64. Why? It's because the young people are eating this stuff up. Oh, this is the song for me. This is it. This is where I'm at in life as a 16-year-old. And they interviewed her, and they said, well, why, why, why do you like this song? Why did you put this thing on as your first thing? And she's like, oh, because I've had so much struggle in my life. And, when, and don't get me wrong, I'm sure there's some 16-year-olds that go through a lot. But, but at the same time, I mean, come on, you're making a lot of money now, you know. But yet here she's singing these songs. But what we see that this is where the culture, this is where our world is going. It's getting very dark. They, they, they want to rule themselves. They don't want others to say, to tell them what to do. And this is where we see that Ruth was at. 
This is where we see that it begins here in the days when the judges ruled. And, and that was a very, very dark era. So what happened? Why did this family, why did this family move? You know, I call this family the prodigal family, really, because they bailed out of the promised land because of a famine. Notice what it says. It says there very clearly that they basically left because there was a famine in the land. That's what made him go. Now, even though the text doesn't say it, it is very, very possible that this famine came upon the land due to the immorality that was going on. It was a judgment, perhaps. Uh, listen to this, Deuteronomy 28, verses 15 through 17. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees that I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You will be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. God's saying, listen, I'm going to hold you guys accountable. Listen, you walk out of here, or you do this, or you ignore me. Listen, I'm going to keep you accountable. I'm going to create circumstances in your life to keep you in line. 2 Chronicles 7, 13 through 14, what the Lord says, When I shut up the heavens so that there is no, no rain, or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God will always give people chances to repent, a chance to repent, to, to really get right with him. I mean, God is a God of grace. Don't get me wrong. God is a God of mercy. Don't get me wrong. But you never want to exhaust God's mercy. You never want to take him all the way far. That I mean, you don't want to do it. You want to love God. You want to, you know what? We, we'll goof up as a Christian. We're not going to be living perfect lives. We know that. But listen, be very careful. If you're in a state where you're just kind of treading away from the Lord little by little, listen, stop doing that get back in the boat because God is a God of grace and he'll give you mercy but if you begin to stretch him out more he will create circumstances in your life to bring you back I guarantee you Jonah saying amen to that because <laughs> wasn't it God who created the storm the Bible says it right there and the Lord created a storm wasn't God who created the guppy right and the, oh, I'm joking the whale the fish whatever it was right see if you guys were paying attention and God created a great fish, right? Listen, hey, we're no different than Jonah. And, and, and praise God that Jonah finally gave up inside that belly, and that fish, and God used them to really experience one of the biggest revivals that we see in Scripture. The, the, the Assyrians, the, the, the crazy, crazy Assyri Assyrians. They were barbaric. I really compare the Assyrians, honestly, this is just my personal opinion, to ISIS. Because the Assyrians were, men, were, were, were people that were actually, they would actually mangle people. They would torture people horribly. And if, and if God can save the Assyrians, man, God can save those ISIS people. Could you imagine a lot of those guys just, just falling down and saying, I give up, Jesus, forgive me. You know, because that's what we need. We need a revival worldwide. People just need to get saved. And we see here that God gives them a, a chance to repent. We see here that they went to the place called Moab. Now, why did he go to Moab? We really don't know why. Perhaps he had some kind of relationship with the people in that area. But the Moabites were descendants of a terrible incestuous union. If you guys remember, after Sodom and Gomorrah, they were, after they were destroyed, Lot was afraid to stay in the city of Zoar. And because of that, he headed up to the mountains, stayed there with his two daughters in the cave. They got, his, they got her uh, her, their, their father drunk. Then, unfortunately, they went in with him, and they had sexual relations with their father, and then they conceived ch uh, children by their own father. And the two kids and the two people that came out of that uh, from this uh, relationship, one, when the first boy's name was Moab, and the other was Ben-Ami. And both of those were crazy enemies of Israel, against Israel continually. 
and we see here that he heads to Moab. So basically, Elimelech made two bad choices. One, leaving the promised land. That's where they were. And secondly, he went to Moab. Now, how far is Moab? Now, I brought a map just to show you, or a picture. If you guys want to project the map here real quickly. He went from Bethlehem to Moab, about 60 miles. But there was no bus ride or train ride. These guys walked. I think it's pretty interesting how he actually went all the way to those mountains, and we see that that was the place that he decided to go. So he made this bad choice, and he brought his entire family. Now, the names of his children, just the, name of the, the names of the family, actually, I'm going to give you the definition, because in Bible times, a person's name had significance. So the name Elimelech, means my God is king. So you know he was a believer in God. The, the, the next is Naomi. Her name is Pleasant. Remember when she came back, she says, don't call me Naomi. I'm not pleasant anymore. Call me Mara, means bitter. So she made sure they understood. The other son, Malan, means sick. Pretty interesting. Killian means wasting away. Orpah, where we get the word Oprah, no, I'm joking, <laughs> means stubborn. And Ruth means friendship. Those names are very significant, and I'll tell you here in a moment why. In verse 3, let's keep reading, tragedy hits the family. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. We're not told why, or how, I'm sorry, how he died, what was wrong, what went wrong. But we were told here that the families hit with a tragedy. So Naomi was left and her two sons. Okay, Naomi's lost her husband, but there's still hope. She's got her two kids. So it's still all right. So though, although she experienced this death, which is pretty sad, we see here in verse 4 that the sons now actually marry Moabite women, obviously being there. It says that now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they, and they dwelt there about 10 years. These guys married Moabite women. God did not specifically say to them, do not marry Moabite women. But he did warn them about the Moabites. Listen to this. Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. After these things had been done, the leaders came to me and said, The people of Israel, including the priests and the Levites, have not kept themselves separate from the neighboring peoples with their detestable practices, like those of the Canaanites, Hitz, uh, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Abunite, uh, Abunites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. They have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons and have mingled the holy place with the peoples around them. And the leaders and officials have led the way in this unfaithfulness. It was unwise for them to take women from any of those groups of people. They blew it. But... Of course, because we know the whole book of, of Ruth. Obviously, Ruth was a Gentile. Through her lineage, I mean, for when she met with Boaz, that's where Christ comes through. So God obviously had a bigger picture, a bigger plan. It was God's providence that we're dealing here with. But when we're looking at these first five verses, you're like, what is going on? So they marry, but it was still unwise for these guys to be going in that direction. You know, we're told in the New Testament very clearly to not be unequally yoked. We're told very clearly in the New Testament, do not be unequally yoked. Anytime a Christian marries a non-Christian, you're asking for trouble. It's not because God doesn't want you to, 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 to marry that person because whatever. It's because there's a, there's a relational gap that, that you're going to run into this marriage with. And what's that relational gap? Jesus. You see, you marry somebody who doesn't know Jesus, and you still want to serve Jesus. You have a person in that household who doesn't care about Jesus. There's going to be some conflict. Somebody's going to give in. 
and it's usually the Christian that gives in. You know, and, 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 I, and I've I talked to a lot of young people, and they're like, well, you know what? Bro, this is, this is missionary dating. It's biblical, you know what I mean? Say, no, missionary dating doesn't work. Usually it doesn't work. Now, listen, I'm a product of a missionary dater. I mean, my wife got saved first, and then she brought me into church. Then I got saved. But I've known my wife for a long time, been married almost 19 years this, this, month, or this year, not this month, this year. But missionary dating usually doesn't work because there's that relational gap, that spiritual relational gap that will be missing in that relationship. And a lot of times, and I've counseled a lot of people afterwards that will say, you know, we're not married anymore. He left me or I had to leave him. Uh, were you guys Christian? No, we were. It's, it's a mess, guys. And then when kids get involved, it's even worse. It's sad. So when we read in Scripture these prohibitions, it's for our good. It's not God trying to keep you from having fun. It's God says, listen, just stay within my parameters. You'll have a great time. And it's important for us to understand these things because as we see that during these situations that we can put ourselves in, we have to stay focused on what the Lord says. So Elimelech is dead. Naomi's by herself. Or not really, not right now. She's with her children. But now things get even worse for her. Notice in verse 5. Then both Malan and Killian also died. Now that right there probably just deflated her emotionally, mentally, physically. Because now we see here that the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Now we have widows. Now we see here that the sons are dead. We're not told again how they passed away, but remember the meanings of their names? <coughs> Excuse me. One was sick and the other wasting away. There are two possibilities here, guys. One is that their kids were already sick. They had a pre-existing condition. And the father took them over to Moab. And somehow that probably didn't work well for them and passed away. Or they just, because they were already sick, we're going to die either way, whether they stayed at the promised land or not. But they were obviously sick kids already. So now we see here that Naomi is now a lonely widow in a foreign land along with her two daughter-in-laws. Not a good picture. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, today, generally speaking, today, any widow today can still find a job on her own, can, can still find some support, can she, uh, support herself. She can still provide for her own needs. I'm just speaking in general here. She, if she wants to remarry, she could probably do that. I mean, she can go on Match.com or whatever, and she can go there and get somebody. You know what I mean? I'm just saying, you know, it's accessible. It's easy, right? But Naomi couldn't do any of that stuff. And the reason why is because back then, widows basically had to depend on the support of others. And not only that, but Naomi was far away from home. She left Bethlehem, the house of bread, and it's interesting because we see here that, that, that their plan was probably not a 10-year plan. I guarantee you it was just, hey, honey, let's just go to Moab. I know a few people there, and, and let's just, let's just kind of wait until the famine is done, and then we can go back home, okay? All right, honey, that sounds good. Maybe in his mind he's thinking, let's give it a month. And listen, he never even made it back, with, not even with his kids. And it was 10 years that's a long time. I doubt they were thinking 10 years. And we see here very clearly that life can feel like that sometimes. You know, life can feel like it's, it's you know, you're lonely. You're, you're in a foreign land and you're wondering, now what? What do I do? What direction do I go? I mean, this is where Naomi was at. Her head was spinning. And that's why when she came back from, from you know, when she finally made it back to Bethlehem, Everybody saw her. Something was wrong with her face. Is that you, Naomi? Is, is that you? I said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Because the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. I mean, she was really, really just spinning her wheels. What is she going to do as a widow now? But life doesn't always have to feel like 10 years in Moab. We have to approach difficulties in a biblical way. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three things here that we can actually learn from this story that will help you and I in difficult times. Now, the first thing that I want you to understand is that difficult times are not always indicators to take action. Difficult times are not always indicators to take action. Because you are going through a difficult time in your life, it doesn't mean you have to move. It doesn't mean that you have to do something. Elimelech looked at his situation, took action, which is commendable as the leader, but without ever seeking God for counsel. I mean, his name is my God is King. And we're like, wait a minute, Elimelech, well, why didn't you trust the Lord here? Well, how do I know that? Well, for two reasons. Why? One is that he left the promised land. God promised them that when he got, brought him into that promised land, that he would provide for them. Listen to this. Deuteronomy 6, 10 and 11. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant, then when you eat and are satisfied. I mean, God says, I will provide for you in that land. You know, like I said, uh, Epaphrite is Bethlehem, which is house of bread. And Elimelech missed seeing God take care of his family's needs in a time of difficult time, uh, difficulties. We got to give the Lord a chance, don't we, to, 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 to do something, right? So, I mean, we all have the tendency to try to bail ourselves out, right? I mean, it's hard to kind of sit still when you're going through a difficult time. You're like, oh, Lord, I'm giving you till tonight. If you don't come through, I'm out of here. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm telling you, Lord. And the Lord's like, you know what? I wasn't going to come to you until like next month. You're like way too early. Relax. I mean, we have to trust God. We have to let him do what he needs to do. And we see here that Elimelech missed it. Listen to this, Psalm 9.9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Did you see that? Listen, seek the Lord. He's not going to forsake you. I love this psalm, Psalm 46, 1, 2, and 3. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Oh, that's awesome. God protects us. God helps there are two kinds of storms that God will allow in your life. Storms of correction and storms of perfection. The storms of correction is to bring you to repentance. Again, I'm sorry, Jonah, but I'm bringing them back. Jonah is a great example. Storms of perfection are storms that God allows in your life to perfect you. That's where we read James chapter 1, verses, uh, chapter 1 verse 2 that says this. Consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So you have to determine what storm you're going through if you are tonight. Is, is God trying to correct you on something? Repent. He'll forgive you. And you're like, I'm not in any sin. Oh, then, then, hey, listen, he's perfecting your faith. He's helping you. He's maturing you as a Christian. I, I, I would love the Christian life to be without any trials. I mean, wouldn't you? I, would, I, I take that any day, right? I mean, I know it's not true. It, it won't happen. We're all going to face trials here and there. You know, all, all that false theology that's out there, you know, that, oh, everything will be great. God will never allow anything in your life. You know, all this, yeah, that's, that's baloney. You know, there's no such thing as Disneyland Christianity. You know, the happiest place on earth. You know what I mean? I mean, we have a joy internally that, that we can go through a trial and be like, I praise you in the storm. But, but to always walk around and think that, you know, there's nothing that's going to happen, we don't know. We just, we don't pray for it. I, I never pray for trials. But, but we've got to trust the Lord. 
Perfection is to, for us to endure so that we can actually become stronger as Christians. Israel was experiencing a famine, perhaps a storm of correction. Moab wasn't the best place to live because the people weren't a good influence. There were other places that he could have chosen, but he didn't. The second thing, if we take action when we aren't supposed to, we are only adding to our difficulties. We have to be careful with that. Again, Elimelech, I believe he had no intentions of going to Moab for 10 years. I'm sure it was a quick trip, but things got worse for him. Got really bad. A month trip, perhaps, ended being a 10, year of, 10 years of misery. And the last one, three, our bad choices can affect our family. Our bad choices can affect our family. I mean, read verse 4. We just read it. You know, we see that they basically passed away. All, uh, you know, her husband, her children. Listen, sometimes it's just better to just hang on during those difficult times. Hang on and trust the Lord rather than taking immediate action. Rather than trying to adjust your life, trying to do something different. Any, anytime you, you're met with any uneasiness or any inconveniences in your life, don't begin to freak out. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will lead your path straight. you got to trust Him, right? You know the word trust there in Proverbs chapter 3? Verses 5 and 6, the word trust means to cling on to God. That's what it really means. That's, that's the thrust of that Hebrew word. It means you hold on to him tight. Don't let go of him. And, and that's exactly what God wants us to do, is to trust him, to understand that. If you're having a hard time at work, it doesn't mean to go find another job. Maybe God is using it to, to, to make you stronger as a Christian. Maybe he's dealing with things in your own life. I've talked to people that say, oh, I'm having such a hard time at work, and i got to find another job. Oh, really? Have you asked the Lord if that's what he wants you to do? And then some leave, and then they're like unemployed for like three months. You know, it's like you got to be careful. you got to judge everything from a biblical perspective. you got to trust the Lord, seek him, pray, so, that he understand, so you understand what's going on. So the question is, should I stay or should I go? And maybe that's where you're at tonight. You're thinking, should I stay? Should I go? What's going on? All I could say is seek the Lord and he's going to show you. Seek him with all your heart. If he says to you, take action, hey, go for it. But if you don't hear from him or if you have a hesitation from the Holy Spirit, I say be patient and don't go ahead of the game. Amen.